two o'clock, so let's get going. I'm Sandy, Sandy Byrne. I'm the Director of Studies for English and Creative Writing at Conted, and I teach here and for the wider university. I'm going to talk today about some popular fiction in the mid-Victorian period, and I've called it the Booker Prize of 1878. Of course, there wasn't a Booker Prize in 1878, so I'm going to ask you to stretch your imaginations a bit and to think about what might have won had there been such a thing at the time. So I'm going to talk about some of the best-selling fiction of that year and what people were reading, because, of course, we don't all confine our reading to what's just been published. And I'm going to talk about ways in which those books reached people, particularly serialisation and through circulating libraries. And then we're going to think about the winners. Some of the best-selling fiction from the period before that would still have been important and popular and successful at the time was sensation fiction. The bestsellers of the 1860s and 70s were often those novels that succeeded Gothic fiction. Whereas Gothic fiction tended to have aristocratic villains and heroines and to take place in romantic and exotic settings, often castles, sensation fiction was more middle class. It often replicated crimes that had been in the newspapers or exaggerated those. It's often called white collar or blue collar crime. And whereas Gothic fiction was supernatural, sensation fiction was all the more scary because it might really happen. And it's all about the <gasps> moment, that moment of sensation. So you may have come across The Woman in White, The Moonstone, Lady Audley's Secret, all these are sensation fictions. But also there are a lot of action thrillers at the time. Stories of Daring Do, they're very popular as well. Battle stories, for example. Romance remains popular, and so does crime. Crime fiction is hugely popular at this time, as it is now. So those are the, as it were, middle-brow and low-brow reading of the time. Lots of reading was still going on of people who weren't around to receive our nominal imaginary Booker Prize. So who was out by then? The Brontes were gone. They were dead. Charles Dickens was dead. W.M. Thackeray was dead. Anthony Trollope was still around, but he'd had his heyday. He'd had his time in the sun as a bestseller. His Palliser series, which had begun as a bestseller, had dropped off in sales and was going to end soon, with very disappointing sales for the Prime Minister and the very last novel, all about poor old Planty Padre's children, began as a bestseller. By the end of the series, it's not doing so well at all. So what is doing well? These were all published in 1878. Thomas Hardy's The Return of the Native. James Payne, by proxy, that sold extremely well. Completely gone now. Wilkie Collins' My Lady's Money. And Weeder, Mary Louise Rame, Friendship. And I'm going to talk a bit about these. Return of the Native was serialised in Belgravia magazine. And that's very important. For a long time, novels had been serialised in fairly inexpensive vastly illustrated or unillustrated periodicals such as Bentley's, Ainsworth or Dickens' All the Year Round. They were being replaced by something more lavish, much better illustrated and much more illustrated periodicals such as Once a Week, The Cornhill Magazine, The Graphic Magazine and Belgravia. Some of the old kind of periodicals were still in circulation at this time. Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine continued for a long time 
for example. But they, uh, many of them were dying out. They weren't hitting those sales figures that they had maintained for several decades. And they were being replaced by something a bit more expensive, a bit more lavish, and above all, more beautifully illustrated. This is an illustration by Arthur Hopkins from Belgravia of the return of the native. This is where Eustacia Vi doesn't realise, I'm afraid the illustration is a bit preposterous, that, that she's been seen. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, in 1878, Hardy was periodicalised, if there's ever such a word, he was serialised by two magazines at once, one in Britain and one in America, for an indiscretion in the life of an heiress, as well as the return of the natives. It's a very busy year for him. We tend to think that Hardy was a bestseller from the get-go. In fact, he wasn't. And in fact, although I've given the return of the native within this list of popular and best-selling fiction, it mostly was selling off the back of what had gone before. It didn't do as well as what was to come, and it wasn't universally loved. Notice here this advertisement for Belgravia telling us what's coming for July. The Haunted Hotel <coughs> and Mystery of Modern Venice by Wilkie Collins. Much bigger letters than The Return of the Native because Wilkie Collins, the novelist of sensation, the novelist, biggest novelist of sensation, is at this stage much more famous, much more important than Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy published a few things and one of them so far has been extremely popular. He's going to publish more and that's going to be even more popular. But he's not Wilkie Collins at this stage. So this relatively young Thomas Hardy is second billing. He's almost always at this stage listed as the author of Far From the Madding Crowd. That's because that's been his most successful work so far. And it does better than The Return of the Native, both in terms of sales <coughs> and in terms of <coughs> criticism. Yes, you. Sorry. No problem at all. <sighs> this is what was said of The Return of the Native at the time. The novel treats tragedy itself as hardly more than a deeper tinge of the common leaden colour of the human lot, and so makes it seem less than tragedy, dreariness rather than tragedy. And that was a quite common opinion at the time, it was just too bleak, too unrelenting, unrelenting, so unrelenting that the great tragedy doesn't seem tragic. And in fact, Hardy changed the ending. And his epilogue notes, rather bitterly I think, the writer may state here that the original conception of the story did not design a marriage between Thomasin and Venn. He was to have retained his weird character to the last and to have disappeared mysteriously from the heath, Thomasin remaining a widow. But certain circumstances of serial publication led to a change of intent. Now one of the problems, or maybe we should say the strengths of serial publication is your audience can get at you before you finish the whole novel. And they can say, no, I don't like that. Change that. This is awful. And your editor is likely to say, sales are falling off, Hardy. Get your finger out and cheer it up a bit. Don't leave them with this unrelenting dreariness or you won't get the money. So we think that's what happened, <coughs> that Hardy was constrained to change the novel somewhat because of public opinion. Who's this? Okay. Wilkie Collins, very good. Very recognisable man there. Now, 
1878, Wilkie Collins published My Lady's Money, which was a novella originally written as a Christmas story for the Illustrated London News. It was then published as <coughs> a two-part novella, together with another story called The Haunted Hotel. Now again, I've put him down as an important author of this time, but in fact, My Lady's Money didn't do nearly as well as his earlier works, as The Moonstone, as The Woman in White, even though it has a dog detective. And <laughs> what, what more could you want? A bit with a dog. It was much less popular than his earlier works for a number of reasons, I think. Apart from anything else, it's shorter and more slight. It was written very sadly with his own dog in mind. He wrote to a friend saying, I'm getting on fairly well and finding the refuge from myself which I had hoped to find in my work. How closely that poor little dog had associated himself with every act of my life at home, I only know now. I can go nowhere and do nothing without missing Tommy. So Tommy, spelt slightly differently, a Scotch terrier, solves the mystery of a missing £500 note by finding a crucial piece of evidence in my lady's money. But it wasn't enough. People bought this, so I think I'm justified in putting it on the bestseller list, because of the name Wilkie Collins. I think they were hoping for more sensation fiction. They were still reading The Woman in White, No Name, Armadale and the Moonstone. They're still in print, they're still selling at this time. But they don't like what follows. The poet Algernon Swinburne very rudely said, What brought good Wilkie's genius nigh perdition? Some demon whispered, Wilkie, have a mission. He started to write social problem novels. Novels with a social intent, a mission. And that did not serve him nearly as well. He was also taking laudanum by this stage. And I think he had written all of the great novels that he had in him. So sadly, what we're seeing here is a falling off of a genius, a falling off of the bestseller author who is trading upon his name to an extent. Does anyone know who this is? Mm, you're much less likely to, so don't worry if you don't. James Payne. It yes, says it says there. if you can read it, if you've got good enough sight, you can see it's James Payne. Now, he's a best-selling author at the time, but how many of us remember him now? He's virtually forgotten how fickle is public taste. He was the editor of the Cornhill magazine and Chambers Journal, and he contributed to Dickens' household words so he was in a very good position to get his work published. And as well as contributing to serials, he also published novels. He was tremendously prolific. He was the author of about 40 novels, including these. Married Beneath Him, Curlian's Year, A County Family, By Proxy, A Confidential Agent, Thicker Than Water, A Grape From A Thorn, The Talk Of The Town, and The Heir Of The Ages. But even though he was tremendously popular, he didn't get a great press either. This is the spectator writing on his deck. And he's talking about various of the, the novels and sort of bringing them all together. The whole is poured out rather carelessly, as men in speech pour out stories, giving an impression of great spontaneity and great laziness. We dare say that is not true in making emendations. In By Proxy, by far the best of the long series of Payne's novels, the good hero is made on the same page to propose to commit suicide for money and to object on moral grounds to taking an overdose of opium. Oops, he's an editor there. The carelessness, however, escapes notice in the vigour and go of the narration, as do some clumsinesses of expression and the effect of the whole if the story is read with decent quickness and without too much 
into too many intervals is one of unalloyed pleasure. To pour out such stories perpetually for 40 years is not perhaps very noble work, and it has always aggravated us to think what the author of that exquisite essay, The Backwater of Life, might have done had he tried a little more, but it is work which during that period has for thousands charmed away the tedium, or I should say which, sorry, one can read James Payne when has a, one has a toothache, and what higher praise of a kind can be bestowed upon mere narration. So this chap, who over 40 years poured out novel after novel after novel, is given the accolade of giving us a good plot, something fast-moving and exciting, but not taking pains over it, and sometimes producing ridiculous, contradictory rubbish. Now, who might that remind you of? Which author writes fast now, fast-paced, fast-moving page-turners that are often considered preposterous? They've been made into many a film. Dan Brown. I think perhaps he was the Dan Brown of the day. And yet, completely forgotten. And how many people have heard of Rita or Marie Louise Ramey? I'm sure a few of you will have done, but far fewer than in her day, when she was indeed among the most prolific and popular of the later Victorian novelists. Her novel, published in 1878, is again one of about 40 that she wrote, but it's of particular interest to us in that it tells us about a new publishing venture. The publishing house Chato at the time began to bring out cheap editions very quickly following the expensive hardback three-volume novels. They weren't paperbacks, this isn't Alan Lane at work, but they were very cheap. The normal practice would have been to have the expensive three-volume hardback for sale for quite a long time, so that anyone who was going to buy that expensive version would buy that expensive version, and then maybe a year later, or even two years later, bring out the cheap version. Of course, the authors got more from the sales of the expensive version, <coughs> but if the cheap version <coughs> sold a lot, it might balance out. But what happens if you know that if you just wait a few months and don't buy the guinea version or the 36 shillings and sixpence version, if you just wait a few months, you'll get one for five shillings? You're quite likely to wait, aren't you? So when Weeder heard that a, a cheap volume of Friendship was going to come out in June, 18, uh, five months after the June 1878 publication of the expensive version, she was quite rightly annoyed. She complained that the new novel looked old when the old, the new version came out, so the old version look, looked, looked old when, when the new one came out, and that she wasn't getting so much money out of it. Her later novel, Moths sold very well in hardback and she expected it to go out of print and into a new edition from which she would make even more money. But Chato told her, nope, they'd broken up the type to make sure there couldn't be another hardback three volume edition and they were going to bring out a cheap edition. Much to her disgust. But this is the beginning of cheap editions coming out quickly and sometimes simultaneously, being available to a wide public. And one reason this happens is because of the circulating libraries. And I want to talk a bit about the circulating libraries because they are very important at this time in how people got books. And I'll, so I'm going to talk about the circulating libraries shortly. I mentioned that in 1878, not everyone is reading only new works. Some old favourites are still selling very well at this time. So the Pickwick Papers, rightly the posthumous papers of the Pickwick Club, 
originally published in 1836 in monthly part. By 1878, the novel had sold 800,000 copies and counting. It's still selling, people are still buying it, it's still in print now, and they're still, of course, reading it now. And the novels of a year or two before are still selling well as well in 1878. And those novels are Thomas Hardy again, The Hand of Athelberta, which was serialised the year before that. George Eliot's Daniel de Ronda, which was serialised from February to September in 1876. Bulwer Lytton's Pausanias the Spartan, James Payne again, who's, he comes up in most years. Fallen Fortunes, Margaret Oliphant, Carita, and Rhoda Broughton, Joan. The Hand of Ethelberta is a social satire and again didn't go down nearly as well as Far From the Madden Crowd, his current bestseller. To read The Hand of Ethelberta immediately after Far From the Madden Crowd <coughs> is to find the surroundings irritating and the story <coughs> nauseatingly dull. The most uneven and contradictory of all Hardy's novels. There are some unusual, even startling things in the hand of Ethelberta, but it is not a work of art. And then there's Daniel Deronda. Now, Daniel Deronda is important for another, a number of reasons. It is a great novel. It is an important novel. It has, since then, been put on most university required reading lists and is considered alongside Middlemarch as one of her greatest works. But at the time, it caused considerable controversy. This is from the New York Times in 1880, so shortly afterwards. The ending so irritated most of Eliot's admirers that they have not yet recovered from their irritation. The average reader demanded that Deronda should marry Gwendolyn, that's one of the, the, the heroines of the novel, Gwendolyn Harleth, instead of Mira, and they have never forgiven either him or his creator for marrying the wrong woman as they conceive her to be. Now, Daniel Deronda is about a young man who discovers that he has Jewish antecedents, and he becomes Jewish and a Zionist. It's a novel very much of two halves, which is only really linked by the tenuous relationship between Gwendolyn Harleth, one of the heroines, and Daniel Deronda himself. And people felt that the two didn't mesh. A lot of Jewish critics loved the part with Daniel Deronda, they loved what they felt was the, the redress against the horrible anti-Semitism of the time, and they loved what it said about the necessity of a homeland for Jewish people. So it was translated into German, into French, into Italian, into Hebrew, into Yiddish, and into Russian. But English writers felt the opposite. They tended to praise the sections about Gwendolyn Harleth, her dreadful marriage to the appalling Grand Court and all that happens to her thereafter. As late as the 1940s, the great critic F.R. Leavis wanted to cut out what he called the bad parts and leave a country house novel circling around Gwendolyn Harleth, whereas some Jewish writers, reviewers, argued for the absolute opposite. They wanted all the parts with Gwendolyn removed and what they called the main theme retained. Eliot said that praise by some of the Jewish writers for her was better than the praise of readers who cut the book into scraps and talk of nothing in it but Gwendolyn. I meant everything in the book to be related to everything else there. So the other reason that Daniel Deronda is important is because of this sequel. How many of you knew there was a sequel to Daniel Deronda? Not surprisingly, because Eliot didn't write it. <laughs> Although you might be forgiven for thinking that she did. It's the New York Times. To meet the public want, a Boston firm has, with more enterprise than honesty, 
published a volume closely resembling Harper's library edition of George Eliot's works and entitled it Gwendolyn, a sequel to Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. It is plainly intended to deceive and has no doubt deceived many persons who do not keep advised of literary movement. A good many others have bought it and read it, although conscious of the imposition, because they were anxious to see Gwendolyn wedded as she should have been, <laughs> while knowing that in real life more women are not so wedded. There is an exalted audacity in this literary fraud. When will the Boston House add a sixth act to Hamlet in which Ophelia <laughs> shall appear as the Princess of Denmark? I'm not sure how well you can see this, I couldn't get a, a bigger picture. But these are the front covers of the Harper edition of the real Daniel Deronda, and next to it, the fake one. It uses exactly the same style, the same kind of type, and it even has the audacity to put George Eliot's name in the same script. And of course, technically it's not a fraud, because it says a sequel to George Eliot's Daniel Deronda, but what you see is George Eliot and Daniel Deronda. And even the spines are similar. We have volume one and volume two of George Eliot's novels in the library edition, which are Daniel Deronda, and next to it, George Eliot's Deronda, with written above it in very small caps, sequel to. I mean, what a cheek. So there, there were complaints, and um, Eliot and her husband, George Henry Lewis, tried to do something about this but it was very difficult and of course the more they did something about it the more oxygen of publicity this fraud got. Was it good? No, great. <laughs> <laughs> but it did marry Gwendolyn to Daniel it, and it's horrifically, horrifically anti-Semitic. It's, it's nauseatingly anti-Semitic. It makes him turn against all Jewish people, turn against the, the very family into which he married and reject them, it kills off his wife and he, it marries him to... So it's a completely different story, it's running along at the same period. Well, it's, it's a made a sequel. It, it follows the ending of Daniel Deronda, but it just completely changes everything. And it brings into it a lot of the same kind of stereotyping and the same kind of mockery that is aimed at Disraeli at this time and some of the uh, illustrations even looked like some of the stereotypical cartoons of Disraeli. A similar thing happens with um, Punch magazine at this time that also mock Daniel Deronda in, in very much those ways. So the way that these novels are getting to people is through the three volume hardback, very expensive at the time from a guinea to about 31 and 6, or sometimes even 36 and 6. That's a lot of money for the average person at the time, a lot of a disposable income. So people tended to share books, they tended to read aloud to a group of people, maybe after dinner, they bought second-hand books where they could, they borrowed them. The circulating libraries made a huge difference to this. Moody's, for example, established in 1840 and W.H. Smith in 1860, enabled people for a very small outlay to take out a subscription for six months or a year, enabling them to borrow books. These book clubs bought a lot of books, these, sorry, these, these circulating libraries and the book clubs that developed alongside them got enormous power. Buying power gave them editorial power. And they exercised that power in a number of ways. They didn't only hold novels, but they did hold a lot of novels. And because in some cases, the whether a book was going to be a bestseller or not depended upon them, they could affect what was in that book. Thomas Hardy's work was much affected by this, censored by this, and you can see in his letters him complaining about this, about the idea of what the book clubs and circulating libraries thought was proper for a young lady reader. 
There are lots and lots of cartoons at the day about circulating libraries and the woman reader. This one, I think you can see it, is titled Light Reading with a Vengeance, and it has a young lady at the counter of a circulating library. And the keeper is saying, I'm very sorry, miss, the third volume happens still to be out, but here is the entire novel in one volume. The young lady says, oh, that won't do. How on earth am, am I to find my place in it? <laughs> so it, it's the opportunity for a lot of mockery of women readers and novel readers. But at the same time, it's enabling women, less well-off people, to get access to books. So they're a good thing. These circulating libraries are terrifically successful in making money for writers, but they're also narrowing them. One person who complained very bitterly about this was George Moore. George Moore, of course, a writer of the later 19th century and early 20th century. He wrote a pamphlet called Literature at Nurse, Circulating Morals, which is all about the way in which the circulating libraries and the book clubs are determining what can and what can't go into fiction at the time. You know, if you give a woman more than a warm handshake in one of your novels, you're liable to be told, oh, that won't do. Quite a lot of writers at this time resort to metaphor and symbol and suggestion for anything more than a warm handshake. And some of them are outraged, particularly George Moore. But nonetheless, this sort of thing would cost you a fortune, whereas you can go and you can borrow it. If you've got ten shillings to spare per six months, you can have as many as you want. Um, until the public libraries start to get going, just after this period, of course, they are a public good. But they also, and this is particularly true of the American book clubs, tend at this time, tend to be really quite prudish. How many of you have ever looked at any of the manuscripts of Thomas Hardy's works? You can find quite a lot of them online. They tend to be quite different from, from the final version. So here we've got the problem of serial... Well, is it the problem? The, the circumstances of serialisation almost repeated with the, the circulating library. If you serialise your novel, you give your reading public a chance to comment as you go, and you might well choose to respond to that in order to be able to continue and to be a bestseller. When the circulating libraries start demanding to be heard and demanding to have editorial influence, once again, as a writer, you have the choice between saying no and maybe not doing so well at all, or conforming and perhaps feeling that your artistic integrity is being compromised. And we have evidence of the successive different editions of Thomas Hardy's works changing what they say. And as morals change and things get a little bit looser, in if you if you ever get hold of a number of different editions of Tess of the D'Urbervilles, yeah. you will find that Tess in an embrace goes from something that's about out here to something that's about out up close like this and very much more passionate <coughs> in the original and, and you know had it gone on with into other editions, goodness knows what she would have done. <laughs> So we've looked at some of the best-selling novels of the day and we've come to Daniel Deronda, which rather than being populist or middle-brow, is considered quite high-brow. But we've seen that she is not immune to public taste, to the idea that the public doesn't like what she wrote Therefore, something must be done, and therefore, we've got a sequel. And I think that's very interesting, because we tend to think of novelists as artists who have autonomy, who produce what they want to say, and then it's published, and there's an end of it. But 
in all these different ways, in serialization and the circulating library, in the problem with copyright of sequels and so on, changes can happen and do happen. So all the novels that we've looked at and what makes 1878 particularly interesting, apart from being the time at which this department was founded, is that not one of these is the most best-selling of their respective authors' careers. Probably none of these would have won the Booker Prize had it existed in 1878. I think it would have been awarded or could have been awarded to George Eliot's Daniel Deronda as the most serious novel that we've looked at, the one that deals with issues, the one that requires most effort, the one that is most intellectually and philosophically engaging, and some would say therefore the least entertaining. But nonetheless, all of these authors could have gone crying to the bank. Although not one of these get back, has made the money on these. Not one of these made the money that others by these same authors made, they sold enough. And that in itself is important. Now in 1878, enough people are buying fiction in order for their authors to, to write and do nothing else. That, I think, in itself tells us a lot about 1878, that people are willing to spend their disposable income on fiction and that it is available for them and that the circulating libraries did a great deal in enabling that. And of course, this is eight years into the Fosterian Education Act of 1870, which attempted to make literacy much more widespread. I mean, it didn't entirely, but it, it made a good start. So literacy is on the up, disposable income is on the up, and people are reading more and buying more. I want to end just by touching on one of these authors that I mentioned, and that's Rita. The reason I want to look at her is because she's a very good example of someone now almost completely forgotten, who, as a woman, was hugely empowered by her writing, and yet completely disliked fame. She wrote so many best-selling, popular novels of the time, that she was able for many years to live in a luxury hotel. It was said that she wrote in bed under purple sheets with purple flowers surrounding her. But she tended to refuse to give interviews and she tended to refuse to take part in literary circles and to be lionised. So she wasn't a celeb, she wasn't selling off scandal or her behaviour or her looks, she was selling absolutely on what she wrote. And what she wrote is amazing. It's so uneven. Some of it is tripe. Some of it is pure romance. Some of it is social problem writing. It's about the difficulties of women in the day. She dares to write about rape and the problem of women and conjugal rights still legal at this time, rape in marriage was not possible at this time. She writes about finance and economics and then she writes about high adventure. She wrote what she wanted, when she wanted, how she wanted and it sold and it sold and it sold and that's extraordinary. And yet how many people here have ever read anything she's ever written? She tends not to be on literary syllabuses. She tends not to be in print. And to be fair, that's quite reasonable in terms of a lot of the things that she wrote. But nonetheless, I think she is a lesson for us all, that it can be done. 
and could be done even at a time when it was much harder for women to be published than men, much harder for them to get any really good and serious criticism. They tended to be criticised as a woman writer rather than a writer Is she in per print? se. Uh, a couple of them are, but not many. You can find quite a lot of them on Project Gutenberg. Do, do you know Project Gutenberg? Um, you go to in a sense, I think it was to do with art. Or is oh, no. No. Gutenberg dot org, so www.gutenberg.org is a great resource for Victorian and older works that are in the public domain that you can legally download and read free and for nothing. That's G L U T E N. Gutenberg, G U T T. Gut. Gutenberg. G O O. Like the library. No. G U T. -U -T. Oh, I see. Right. There is also an e book published by Delphi, which I've heard of. Oh, that's works. Did, did you hear that? that? There's an, there's an e yes. We've just been told there's an e book by Delphi that has the complete works. Thank you for that. Is, is James Payne in print at all? The Not that wrote? I know of. I, I found know. some of his works in second hand bookshops and I found him on Abe and on Gutenberg, of course, but I haven't found any of his in print currently. Uh, I think deservedly so, to be fair. I do think they are you know, fairly slap down. Okay, so... Who decides this is the ones that stay on? I, I'm know, sorry? And what body of academics decides which ones carry on? Which books remain in print, you mean? Or which ones that we're, we're reading now, Sam? Well, that's a very good question, and it's a very complicated answer question, that would yeah. take... The, the question was... Who decides which books carry on, which remain in print and are taught and read? And that's all to do with the canon and canonicity and ideas of literary value and literary worth. It's partly a commercial decision, partly happenstance, and partly an academic decision. So a publisher will keep something in print while it's selling or while they think it will sell. The question of literary value is a very complicated one. And has attracted different ideas at different times. And of course, literary value, however you define it, is not necessarily the same as popularity. You might enjoy something, but not think it's great. And you might really admire another text, but not want to read it again. So just before I take questions, these are sources, if anyone is interested in following this up, the English Common Reader is very good on publishing history and reading history. F.R. Leavis, the great tradition, is very much concerned with the question that you're talking about of literary value mm -hmm. and the canon. Victoria Pop Victorian popular fiction by Reginald Terry is very useful on what the Victorians were reading and why and when. As, as a history of the English novel, David Trotter's work is very good. And if you're interested in Jewish reception of Daniel Deronda, that is extremely useful and informative as well. What course do you teach then? Uh, for, for continuing yeah. education? I teach a number of courses. I teach on the Masters in Literature and Arts, on the Foundation Certificate in English. I do a weekly class on Jane Austen. I sometimes do a weekly class on critical reading, which is how to do English studies. And I do a lot of day schools, so lots of different things. And the, the wider university I, I teach from 1740 to the present. Is it critical reading poetry and prose? Yes. So, questions, please. One, two. I, I thought um, George Eliot was, had quite strong opinions that she liked to share with her readers. I'm quite surprised <coughs> that, that she compromised. You, you were saying she changed the end of Daniel Deronda? No. No, not no, no, she didn't change it. The, no, the, the, it was the, the person who wrote the sequel changed it. The, no, she, was, she was true to her own ending. I was also daydreaming at that point. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> so the New York Times review referred to him as him. So people, when did people know that it was it, a woman. It was known by then. Even in that it was, it was known. known yes. And I, mean, I don't see, as though all these other women authors at the time, why she had to disguise. I know, you know, <coughs> she was known in literary circles with her husband, she was a woman. So with other women writers, why did she have to. I the, think that the she, she wanted to be read as a writer, not as a woman writer. 
still at this time, a lot of reviewers would pat <coughs> lady writers on the head and say, you know, well done, it's pretty good for a woman. And I think George Eliot wanted to be judged as a writer, and particularly at first. And then, of course, once she's living, as would have been said, in sin, with George Henry Lewis, even though she insisted on referring to him as her husband, there's another reason for some distance between her and, and, and the public. And this, of course, the Brontes, a generation before, had, all, had used gender-neutral names, and a, a number of women wrote as a lady for all, all sorts of different reasons. But you're quite right in saying that by this time, women were yeah. publishing under their own names. Are there any other questions? Yes. How do you feel that social media today is affecting the canon of modern literature? It's a good question. I, I think we still have ideas about literary value and the difference between popular literature and literary fiction, but we'd be very hard put to make a very firm distinction between them. The social media certainly promotes some authors and we're all told that if we're going to publish we've got to be on social media and have to promote them which just makes me cringe I can't do it, can't do it. so my books sell maybe six copies <laughs> but I don't know whether social media really in the end determines what anyone wants to read I certainly read reviews although more in in the papers than, than online and, you know, I know if John Kerry has reviewed something and said it's good, I'll probably like it. If Peter Kemp reviews something, he'll find something interesting to say, and I'll think, oh, maybe I'll, I'll have a look at that. But in the end, I think we make up our own minds, don't we? We're always told, oh, people's attention span is not what it was. They're not going to pay attention to a big, long book. And then a huge, long book comes out, such as uh, Hilary Mantel's work, and everyone reads it. So although we do have flash fiction, which is meant to take as long as it takes to smoke a cigarette standing outside and read it on your phone, we also have the family saga, we also have big historical novels, so we have all sorts of things. <coughs> I think there was a question over here, wasn't there? Okay. How early in the century do, they, do the novelists start to experiment with narrative? I'm, I'm thinking by the end of the century, Right and from and the beginning. Right from the beginning of the novel, in in this the late seventeenth century and the early eighteenth century, people are thinking, what is this thing, and what is it, and wh how far can we push the boundaries? So you get all sorts of different things. You get the epistolary novel, the novel in letters. You get faction. You get Daniel Defoe writing a journal of the plague year, which is supposed to be sort of journalistic and, and uh, factual, but it's actually partly fiction. You get um, novels told by unreliable narrators. You get the Newgate journal uh, novel, which is supposed to be uh, the confession of someone who's been interviewed while they're you know, on their way to the scaffold. As you say, you get Tristram Shandy, which goes <laughs> like this and has a blank page and a marbled page and never really goes anywhere. So you get um, stories with w what we call a framed narrative. You know, I didn't write this, this was told to me with the dying gasp of, of the wretched <laughs> Matilda, or this manuscript washed up in an old sea chest, that sort of thing. So from the very beginning you have experimentation, some beginning at the end, some beginning halfway through some told by animals, all, all sorts of different things. It's always been a wonderful, lively genre. What about the influence of the modern book club, where people are just sharing novels? Yeah, uh, and modern book clubs do wonders for sales, whether they are local or they're TV book, book clubs, and you get the sticker on it, it says Judy and Richard, what's his name? Richard. Yeah. They, they apparently sell very well and the sort of celebrity endorsements do sell that, and I think they're great if they introduce people to reading and, and get them started the and then writers? those people get branch out. I don't know whether they, they influence the writers um, I think that most commissioning editors have a good nose and would know if someone were writing to a market you can generally tell, can't you, if you, if you read a story and it's 
It's an imitation Dan Brown or an imitation Hilary Mantel or an imitation anything because someone thinks, oh, you know, jump on that bandwagon. And I think anyone who tried to guess the taste of a book club would either get it wrong or they'd base it on something the book club had liked before and they wouldn't do it as well and it wouldn't sell. So I have you know, great respect for the great British reading public and I think they, they would know. And so would commissioning editors. Do you think that either public or uh, critic stroke academic taste has actually changed that much over the 140 years? <laughs> are the underlying themes, if they seem the crime, action, are, are they still the same? I think, yes, we still have those genres and we still have those subgenres, we still have those subjects and those kinds of writing. But how many people would now read someone like James Payne? I'm not so sure. Some Victorian and earlier novels now read to us rather dreary and rather slow. I'm thinking in particular of Gothic novels. And Gothic novels at the time seem to have genuinely terrified people. Now you're more likely to die laughing <laughs> because they seem so ludicrous. So I suppose what's happened is each succeeding generation of gothic e type writing has upped the ante on the scariness of it or the horror of it, and that changes our taste, and then the, the next generation has to go further and further. But in some ways, we're still reading the same kind of thing. I mean, we, we read Thomas Hardy today, don't we? We read Dickens today. Um, I reread Bleak House only the other day and, and loved that stunning opening as much as I ever did. I read Jane Austen all the time. So, yes and no, I think, is the answer to that. What do you think of e-readers as a reading well, at first I was very snotty about them and said I'd never have one. Yeah. And then I took one on holiday and I haven't looked back because I'm, I'm kind of notorious in my family for hardly taking any clothes but taking 25 books to, and I'm paranoid that I might not have a book on a train or a plane or something. And now I've got an e-reader. Um, but it's, it's fatal. At night I'll finish a book and buying another one is a few clicks away. Well, and you know, my bank balance is not doing good. But what I don't like is the typography. Mm. I like having a proper book. I like the weight of it, the smell of it, the look of it. So if I'm buying something I'm going to read again and again and again, it will be a book. If I'm buying something that I'm going to value greatly, it will be a book. But an e-reader is, is very convenient. Well, I can see our next group. I'm just finishing the set. Sorry? You're more of a consumer, I think. Yes, I think that's a good, good way of putting it. Yes, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your attention. <laughs> 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 with the, with the <laughs> yeah, it did. It was good. It came out well. Sure. Yeah. Is it really too dark for a photo here? What do you think, Jonathan? Uh, I think we'd be okay. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we can check it after anyway. Let me just uh, wipe my very shiny forehead. It's so hot. It's hot. It is a bit hot. It is hot. Yeah. Thank you. Anyways, I think one of those is one. Try to focus in on one of the other. Oh, right, okay, yeah.